It's really a pleasure to talk here because um, the very first edition in 2011, um, that was for me an opportunity to familiarize myself with the work of, of Robin Card Harris that um, eventually led me to do my PhD with him. So this conference holds a, a special place in my heart. So it's a great pleasure to, um, to now share of some of my own research at this, this place. Um, so my research concerns uh, psychedelics and music. Um, how, um, what the underlying brain mechanisms are, and also what the role is of music in psychedelic therapy. And what I really would like to give as a take-home message before I give this talk is that music may be a very important element in psychedelic therapy. And secondly, by studying the psychological and also the neurophysiological um, mechanisms behind it, we can, uh, we can contribute to developing psychedelic therapy in an evidence-based manner. And also um, by studying um, the brain mechanism underlying this, we can also maybe uh, gain a better understanding on how the brain is able to produce these complex subjective experiences that people often describe. And I try to argue for these points by um, talking about some of the recent neuroimaging work we are uh, doing at Imperial with LST and also uh, sharing a little bit about um, a clinical trial that we're currently running with psilocybin for treatment resistant depression. Um, I start the presentation by uh, trying to answer the question why it is significant to study psychedelics in music. I will then share some uh, study results from the LSE neuroimaging study. Um, then I will um, try to bridge the neuroscience part with the uh, translational element, um, the, the use of music in psilocybin um, assisted therapy for depression. And in the, in the end, I will share with you some interpretations, some of the ongoing analysis that we're still doing. So first of all, why, why is it relevant to study psychedelics and music? Um, I think a, a, good, a good answer to the question can be found by, when we look at the historical context um, of psychedelics and music. And uh, this is a really interesting finding. It's a really old flute. It's estimated to, to be one of the oldest musical instruments um, around that we found, and it's estimated to be 35,000 years old. And the researchers discussing the significance of this finding, they argue that um, because this flute is such a sophisticated instrument already, people have probably been engaged in music making and musical activities for much more longer than that. And not only music has been used for a long time by, 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 um, by, by humans, um, there's also more and more evidence that psychedelic plants have been consumed by humans for, for thousands of years. And not uncommonly, music and psychedelics um, have been um, um, consumed and used in a, in a combined format. Uh, this is pointed out by the famous uh, ethnomusicologist um, Bruno Nettel, and also more uh, recently by the um, uh, researcher Marlene uh, dobkin Rios, where they uh, state that music is a very integral element to uh, traditional psychedelic ceremonies. When we forward in time to the 40s, to the accidental discovery of LSD, um, where Albert Hoffman accidentally intoxicated himself um, with LSD, and um, he describes his experience in uh, his autobiography, LSD, My Problem Child. <laughs> and um, there's an interesting passage there that I'd like to share with you. He's writing there, it was particularly remarkable how every acoustic perception, such as the sound of a door handle or a pausing automobile, the game transformed into optical perceptions. Every sound generated a vividly changing image with its own consistent form and color. So I found it, found it interesting that already the very first report on the subjective effects of LSD, there's already a really close link described between uh, the psychedelic state and how it interacts with, with sound. And we go um, a little bit more forward in time, very soon after the discovery of LSD, uh, psychedelics were intensively investigated for their therapeutic potential, both in Europe and the United States. And um, important figures in the field, like Hans Karl Lohner and Stanislav Grof, they placed a really strong <coughs> emphasis on uh, the setting, and the setting of the treatment room where these uh, treatment sessions took place for many hours. And as part of that setting, music was considered to be a very important component. And what is really interesting is that at uh, Maryland Institute uh, for Psychedelic Research in Baltimore, 
they started to work together with a music therapist called Helen Bonney. And Helen Bonney was um, working specifically to um, design optimal playlists for psychedelic therapy and also to answer questions like what is the role of, of, of music in, in LSD therapy and how can we, how can we harness those, um, that interaction <coughs> effect between LSD and music in order to um, enhance therapeutic outcome. And her work is, um, she describes her, her, um, her findings in a paper together with the publisher, together, together with um, Walter Penke in 1967. And there she summarizes that um, music helps the patient by, first of all, um, stimulating the imagination, enhancing mental imagery. Secondly, to let go in order to um, uh, get more um, immersed in, in the um, subjective experience. Uh, thirdly, by uh, releasing emotions. Fourth, by contributing towards spiritual type experiences or peak experiences. And fifth, by, directing, by directing or structuring the experience. A few decades later, um, speaking about uh, the time right now, there's a lot of new research to the clinical use of, of psychedelics. And um, importantly, um, all of them, um, to my knowledge, still incorporate music as a, as a key element in the therapeutic approach, where the patient is uh, promoted to, encouraged to, to lie down um, with uh, his or her eyes closed and listen to um, a music playlist, a carefully designed music playlist for the um, duration of the peak drug effects. And this, of course, invites us to ask um, a lot of important and interesting scientific questions. And First of all, um, the simple uh, question, is it true that psychedelics enhance the subjective effects of music? And this is a question we tried to answer in one of our small pilot studies with LST. Um, Phoebe's accepted in psychopharmacology, so it will be available to read soon as well. In this study we had 10 um, participants. They received intravenous LSD and they listened to a two playlists, one under placebo and one under LSD conditions. And the, the playlist was balanced for its emotional potency and randomized across conditions. After each song, we asked them, how emotionally affected were you by the music? And when we averaged that over the whole playlist, we found that LSD significantly enhances the emotional response to music. More interesting, maybe, is the question, what types of emotions are specifically enhanced by LSD? And we used um, a questionnaire called the Geneva Emotional Music uh, Skill that is specifically developed to assess uh, certain types of emotions that are characterized by music experiences. And um, we performed the questionnaire as well in this study and we corrected for multiple comparisons and we found that LSD enhances, compared to placebo, um, emotions of wonder, transcendence, power and tenderness. And I think especially the enhancements of wonder and transcendence are interesting in the context of spiritual type experiences. As many of you are aware, there's um, a lot of re research that shows that uh, psychedelics can induce these spiritual type experiences and also that um, the therapeutic outcome is um, predicted by the occurrence of these kind of experiences. So if that is true, and if it's also true that music enhances these kind of emotions, that might suggest that indeed music can be a very important element in psychedelic therapy in order to induce or increase the likelihood of these experiences to occur. So then the next question is, how do psychedelics enhance the subjective response to music? What are the underlying brain mechanisms? What can we learn when we administer LSD in a neuroimaging environment and look at brain connectivity, brain connectivity patterns with um, different neuroimaging modalities like fMRI and MAC? And in this case, um, before I uh, jump into the design of the study and, and the, um, the results, I give a little bit of background of the um, uh, the, the prior research that has been done that informed our hypotheses. Um, we have a really strong focus on the parahippocampus. And the parahippocampus is a part of the medial temporal lobe system, which is situated deep inside the brain. Uh, it's part of the temporal lobe, as the name suggests. And the parahippocampus is very interesting because it's activated by psychedelics. It's activated um, uh, in the context of personal memory recollection. Uh, it's activated when people are instructed to imagine uh, imaginary scenes or landscapes <coughs> and it's also involved in music evoked emotion. Damage to the parahippocampus on the other hand um, is shown to attenuate some of the subjective effects of LST. <coughs> it's shown to attenuate um, uh, music evoked emotion 
And also very interesting damage to the parapocampus is related to the occurrence of visual hallucinations and memory impairment, especially episodic personal memory impairment. More interesting, I think, is what happens when you experimentally increase activity in the parapocampus by direct stimulation. There's a few studies that did that. Um, there's a recent study published in the Journal of Neuroscience by, uh, by McGavin et al., 2014, and they show that if you stimulate a part of the parapocampus, called the parapocampal place area, that um, participants reliably <coughs> experience really vivid um, visual landscapes that they see with their eyes closed. Other studies show that if you stimulate the parapocampus, people um, report um, that they start to re-experience certain personal memories from their past. What is also very important for the present discussion is that um, a study by Barbo et al. in 2005, they uh, stimulated the parapocampus, but they also simultaneously recorded activity directly from the visual cortex and the parapocampus. And they showed that um, they stimulated different parts of the medial temporal lobe system, that if you stimulate a part of the, part of the medial temporal lobe called the perirhinal cortex, um, that's um, in particularly uh, reliably evokes um, vivid re-experiencing of the personal, uh, personal memories. And not only that, on the moment when these personal memory recollections um, happened, um, this was also accompanied by increased coupling between the parapocampus and the visual cortex. So this, all these studies led us to hypothesize that um, LSD enhances mental imagery via modulating parapocampal visual cortex connectivity. So I start with the design of the study. Um, we administered um, LSD to 20 volunteers, but for this particular analysis we included 12. Um, there was one who didn't uh, complete the study, there were a few that um, have moved too much in the scanner, and we also had some technical problems with the uh, music equipment. All participants received 75 micrograms of LSD um, and they, um, on one occasion and placebo on another occasion. And the order of um, the conditions was randomized. So 10 participants received LSD first and the other half received placebo first. The first had a resting state scan without music for seven minutes. And this was followed by a music scan for seven minutes. And then followed again by another scan um, without music, all in eyes closed conditions. Before and after each scan, so both the resting state scan and the music scan, we asked them, did you experience simple eyes closed hallucinations? Or, the, or and did you experience complex eyes closed in, um, hallucinations? And we asked them a few more questions, but these two are of particular interest for the present um, discussion and hypothesis. We also had a questionnaire, sorry, we also had a questionnaire at the end of the study where we rated certain uh, subjective experiences uh, when people are inside the scanner. And one item was, I saw scenes from my past, my personal past. And um, we also looked at that in, um, in subsequent slides. So these are the, um, is one of the first um, results we got from this analysis. We looked at uh, connectivity of the parahippocampus, the bilateral para parahippocampus, and we first contrasted uh, changes in connectivity between the parahippocampus um, induced by music compared to rest. And then on the second level analysis, we looked at um, um, how are these changes different from LSD compared to placebo. And what we found was, as you can see, is that there is this very big um, activation in the uh, visual cortex. And there's also activations or increased connectivity, sorry, these are not activations. There's also increased um, connectivity with the parahippocampus in the um, inferior frontal gyrus, which is, um, uh, includes Broca's area, and the, um, an, uh, the anterior insula. So now we ask the question how, um, we, we showed that these areas are more connected with each other. Um, in, uh, under these conditions, but um, what can we say about the information flow between these areas? Um, what is, uh, and why is this interesting, why is this important, is that um, the brain is organized in a strictly hierarchical fashion and um, we can functionally differentiate between forward and backward connections. And I will, in the discussion, elaborate a little bit more on what the meaning is of these forward and backward connections. So we used uh, a method called dynamic causal modeling, and this is um, a diagram that illustrates the method. Um, PHC stands for the parahippocampus, VC stands for the visual cortex, um, D stands for um, a drug effect, M stands for a music effect, 
I stands for an interaction effect. Uh, so we modeled the main drug effect, the main music effect, and an interaction effect between LSD and music. And we started with a full model where we allowed to have all those effects having um, a modulatory effect on all these connections. And then we used a Bayesian optimization scheme that allowed us to estimate um, which of those um, experimental inputs significantly affect um, some of these connections. And um, what we found was that um, only when music and LSD are both present, so the interaction effect, that is the moment, um, that is the um, experimental input where um, information flow is um, enhanced from the parapocampus to the visual cortex. When we then plot the individual parameters for each subject, so these are the coupling parameters um, plotted, um, you can see that actually not all of the participants uh, show an increase in connectivity. Some of them actually show a decrease in connectivity. And um, this is actually interesting because we can ask, for instance, the question, does this individual variance in changes in these connectivity parameters maybe explain some of the variance that we also observed in the subjective effects of LSD and music? So as, as I just shared with you, we have um, these in-scanner ratings and we correlate it um, the increases or decreases in connectivity by the interaction effect with some of these subjective effects. And we found indeed that um, participants who showed the strongest enhancement of information flow from the parapocampus to the visual cortex were also those participants that um, rated that um, the occurrence of complex visual imagery was enhanced by music under LSD. Whereas people who um, had a negative modulation of the connection, they actually reported a decrease in complex symmetry. And we also co uh, correlated this with the item, uh, I saw scenes from my past, and we saw that um, people who um, scored, uh, reported, um, scored the highest on this item, these were also the, the participants that um, showed the strongest enhancement of this connectivity. So to just summarize the whole story, um, we found here that LSD and music interact to increase information flow from the parapocampus to the visual cortex, and also that it correlates with uh, some of these subjective effects like enhanced complex visual imagery and the item seeing scenes from my past. And then the question is, of course, um, why is it that only when music and LSD are both present together that only then information flow is enhanced in that direction specifically. And I think some interesting clues can be found when we look at the um, entorhinal cortex, which is part of the parahippocampus. And it's a really uh, um, interesting area within the parahippocampus because it's considered a, a hub region. Um, it's um, densely con um, it shows really dense connectivity with um, a lot of, especially sensory cortices, like the visual cortex and the auditory cortex. And it's, it's, it's funneling that information back and forth towards the uh, the hippocampus. Um, so the parapocampus, and especially the entorhinal cortex, has strong um, bidirectional connectivity with the visual cortex. But also, very important for this discussion, is that it has direct input from the auditory cortex. These projections terminate on a deep layer 5 pyramidal neurons. And it are, it are especially these, these neurons that express the serotonin to A receptor, which is the primary target of psychedelic drugs like LSD. And um, it are also these neurons in the entorhinal cortex that provide top-down predictions to the visual cortex. So this leads us to the following hypothesis, and that is that um, seeing scenes while under um, the influence of LSD and listening to music may be the result of um, an enhanced engagement of these top-down predictions um, encoded by um, the parapocampus of visual cortex pathway. And I think a funny illustration of that is something that I think many of us have been exposed to recently. Uh, this is an image of the um, Neural Networks project by Google. And um, it, it's an image uh, recognition algorithm that is informed by uh, some of our recent understandings of how the brain works and how the brain um, uh, processes perception. And here the, the, the brain is not viewed as a passive organ that passively processes perception, but it's actually really actively engaged in our perception in, uh, in a way that it is constantly trying to predict sensory information based on prior experience, based on prior knowledge. And so as the brain, so does this algorithm. Um, it's, it's learned to identify certain objects in time 
And then when it's um, exposed to a certain image, like for in this case, an image of a cloud, and um, not only that, we, we force or we bias the algorithm to, um, to um, perceive um, something within those clouds, we see the occurrence of these, these, these strange psychedelic images. And I think this is a very interesting illustration of how psychedelics probably work in the brain, and, and that is by um, inducing a, a hyper-excitability of those pathways that encode, uh, encode these uh, both low-level and high-level belief, belief systems and uh, make them, for instance, visual. Um, in this case, we could argue that uh, the pathway from the parapicampus to the visual cortex um, may indeed encode uh, predictive codes for landscapes and, and, and personal memories. And when that pathway in particular getting um, activated by LSD and music, that may explain some of these subjective effects that, that we also um, reported in this study. Now, the big question is, of course, um, um, seeing um, uh, pig snails and camel birds uh, is probably not very uh, therapeutic, um, but it's important to realize that our brain uh, is um, trained to recognize more than just animals. And as I just mentioned, especially parapicampus is involved in personal memories and, 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 and a complex, complex visual perception. And, and how does this translate to the, the clinical setting? I think that's a really interesting question. So um, we're currently performing a study where we administer psilocybin to treatment-resistant depre uh, depressed patients. Um, the, it's an open-label uh, trial. They receive uh, psilocybin on two occasions, um, a low dose of 10 milligrams first, and then a week later, a medium to high dose of 30 milligrams. Um, this is the setting. Um, as you all um, are aware of, uh, as I just mentioned, setting is very important in psychedelic therapy sessions. So we did a little bit of effort to make it a bit more nicer for our participants. So we changed the lights, um, had some drapes, um, removed some of the unnecessary equipment in the room. And um, in, in, in this particular uh, case, um, we do a structured interview with the patients after their treatment and also a questionnaire on the role of music. What is the role of music in, in the therapeutic context? And I don't want to go into too much depth there because um, the study is still ongoing, but um, I just want to share you a little bit of, of what is happening here. And I uh, provided some, um, some quotes from these interviews because I think they're interesting and also relevant to the um, present discussion. So one, uh, one patient uh, says, during my high dose experience, when I had this difficult moment, I think that the song that came up was very soothing and it sort of made me calm down and get out of that and bring nice images. I imagined I was an unborn child and I felt very safe. I think every new song could bring a different image and I couldn't finish thinking about the previous one. It was very interesting. Sec uh, another patient says, the music made me even more emotional. The sad songs would bring up painful memories on, and happy songs would make me think of a good period in my life. And this patient is saying, it was comforting knowing that the music was there, because during the whole period there was music in the background, and I think it grounded me. So we both play the music via a high quality um, stereo system in the room, and on top of that patient also listened to the music via headphones. And we do that uh, for um, a variety of reasons. First of all, um, when the patient takes off the earplugs, um, the experience continues because the music continues. Um, secondly, um, from a, from a um, um, music enthusiast perspective, um, there's some sound leakage coming through. So it, um, the music quality of the, hear, the, the ear um, phones are already quite good. But if, on top of that, if we have this physical um, or this spatial element of sound, and there's some sound leakage, and I think it enhances the, um, the spatiality of the sound. Um, thirdly, and this is very important, um, uh, playing the music in the room also allows the therapist to, to understand where the patient is, 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 is in her or his journey at that moment. So we, we're doing this mainly because we, are, we want to answer the question, how can we optimize music for psychedelic therapy? I'm not going to read those, um, those points because I'm running out of time. But I, I can read the last bit because I think that's interesting. Uh, one patient said that high pitch frequency just hit my ears weird and it sent the wrong energy down my whole body. So um, this kind of information is important um, in order to um, compose music maybe. 
and also to design playlists. And this is also something we are about to um, about to start up is working together with some composers in order to develop uh, music that is uh, informed by neuroscience and therapeutic research. Um, just quickly, a, a few um, <coughs> ongoing research projects. Um, I just skipped a few because I think this is one that I think I am particularly um, enthusiastic about and it also links um, uh, with the question of how we can develop music for therapeutic experiences. How can we model the dynamics of music? Um, in the previous analysis I shared, we just treated the whole block as one single block of music that we then contrasted with rest. Uh, but in reality, of course, music is highly dynamic and it is especially these dynamics within the soundtrack that um, make us um, be moved by the music and be carried away by the music. Um, so we are, we, there are two different projects here. One of them is we, um, we decompose the music we used in the study into its different components, where we look at the pitch and we look at the different harmonies and how those uh, elements change in time. And by that we can identify certain brain regions that are involved in, in um, processing these elements. But we can also see how that links with some of these subjective experiences. And, um, and maybe that can also help to inform uh, uh, these compositions that we're planning to, to work on. And this is a, co a collaboration with uh, Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, uh, uh, Dr. Frederick Barrett. Another element that um, I'm really interested in to uh, finish up is um, the rewarding aspect of music. Um, a lot of neuroscience research looked into how music engages the reward system of the brain. And we like music because um, music that is good is able to find that sweet spot between uh, novelty and predictability, uh, novelty and predictability on the other hand. Uh, so for this I worked together with Dr. Marcus Pierce, who is a music theorist and a mathematician at Queen's Mary University. And he developed this algorithm where you can um, look at the sequence of, of notes and, and then this algorithm is able to give you a measurement, the time series of entropy, or in other words, the predictability of the music soundtrack. And then we try to uh, look how this correlates with certain changes in the brain. And um, I just stop here and like to thank um, a few people in particular. Um, uh, Robin Carr Harris, Professor David Nutt and Amanda Fielding for um, doing a huge amount of work in initiating this project. I'm, I'm really grateful um, for them that I'm able to do my PhD on this topic. Um, and then there's a, a, whole, uh, a whole group of other people that all have been very um, influential in this project and, and still will be over the coming time. Um, thanks a lot for your attention.